So panelists and participants, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening for some of you, and welcome to this session that covers major topics of humanitarian aid, development, peace building. My name is Duncan McQueen. I'm the lead on forests and prosperity at the International Institute for Environment and Development. And I'm also representing the forest and farm facility that channels funds directly to local organizations for policy work, business, climate resilience, and social services. Today, however, I'm your moderator for this independent side event uh, to the United Nations Food Systems Summit, aiming at leaving no one behind in drylands regions. Before we start, I wanted to remind you uh, that this session takes place in webinar mode, and you therefore must raise your hand or preferably write in the chat in order to intervene. But this will not be a typical webinar. We do want to hear from you. My colleagues from behind the scenes are now pasting a few brainstorming questions in the chat for you to look at. And we'll look at them together in just a second. Please write in the chat your observations and answers to these questions. Today's session is dedicated to investigating and identifying missing pieces in a participatory manner. So the questions that you'll see in the chat are, are the recommendations that you'll hear today applicable? What key actions could strengthen the resilience of dryland food systems? Who should the main actors be? And what is missing in the puzzle of solutions? Our session today brings regional and global experts and practitioners to provide insights on game-changing solutions and transformative actions to build climate-resilient dryland regions while ensuring food and nutritional security. Now, dryland ecosystems have often been overlooked, but they're important for a wide range of reasons, from food security to climate change. For example, they contain 27% of the world's forests. They store 30% of the world's soil organic carbon, and they supply about 60% of the world's food production. However, as important as drylands are for food security and mitigating climate change, they're also characterized by variable rainfall, increasing temperature, and water scarcity. The impacts of climate change are exacerbating these conditions. That means longer periods of drought, accelerated desertification, and resulting impacts on biodiversity and vegetation cover that uh, reduce soil fertility. And this has negative impacts on food security and nutrition. At the same time, we have population growth coupled with expansion of drylands due to climate change, increasing the number of people living in challenging conditions, perhaps by as much as 70% by 2030, affecting as many as 3.8 billion people. So climate change acts as a conflict threat multiplier, whereby already fragile ecosystems and local communities are pushed beyond coping capacity, resulting in increased tensions relating to natural resource use. Key vulnerable groups in dryland ecosystems include pastoralists and farmer households, as well as internally displaced persons, refugees and migrants resulting from the impacts of climate change and conflict. Women and children are especially vulnerable. But enough from me, let's kick off this event by inviting Professor Salim al Haq to speak. He's the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD in Bangladesh, and is an expert on the links between climate change and sustainable development, particularly from the perspective of developing countries. He was the lead author on the chapter on adaptation and sustainable development in the third assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and was the lead author of the chapter on adaptation and mitigation in the IPCC's fourth assessment report. Professor Huck could not be here with us today, but he's kindly shared his opening remarks in a recording. 
Over to you, Professor, and thank you for making sure you could partake in today's panel. Hi, I'm Salim al -Haq. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University Bangladesh. And I'm also the chair of Action Track 5 on Resilience of the UN Food Systems Summit. And it's my privilege to be speaking to you today. I'm going to talk about three things. The first one is the fact that climate change is now a reality. The recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sixth assessment report Working Group 1, which is a science group, has made a very clear, unequivocal report for the very first time that climate change is a reality. We have already raised global temperature above 1 degree centigrade compared to a pre-industrial period, and that is having impacts all over the world. One of the big impacts is on food systems. Without any doubt, we know that food systems are going to be very adversely affected around the world in every country by climate change, and at the same time, uh, a lot of agriculture also contributes to climate change by uh, producing emissions of greenhouse gases, particularly methane as well as carbon dioxide. And so uh, food systems and climate change are very closely linked and are, have to be taken together. And one of the outcomes of the uh, Action Track 5 in particular of the Food System Summit is going to be taking these two issues together. And then the third element of that is at the local level. And particularly in dry lands around the world, uh, which are drought prone, we are seeing impacts in large parts of the world, in South Asia, in Africa, West Africa, in the Sahel region, and other continents as well, uh, where dry lands are being further affected by the impacts of climate change, particularly high temperatures and longer drought periods. And it is affecting not just food systems, but even uh, people's habitation and, and forcing people to migrate away from their traditional lands into cities or even across borders. And therefore, this particular area of work that we hope will go forward and we've got a very good alliance of countries and organizations and institutions from all over the world who are going to be coming together to work on this issue of dry lands in making the food systems in dry lands, uh, and particularly at the local level, uh, more resilient to climate change as we go forward in the next nine years that are left of this particular decade to 2030. Uh, I wish you have a good uh, discussion, and I look forward to working with you over the coming years. Thank you, Professor Huck, for those incredible insights and for underlining the threat of climate change to food systems, particularly in these drought-prone drylands and the need for an alliance uh, necessary to make transformative change. Now, yesterday, the UN General Assembly proclaimed the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, following a proposal for action by over 70 countries. The decade runs from 2021 through 2030, with a focus on halting the degradation of ecosystems and restoring them. The aim is to build resilience, reduce vulnerability, and increase the ability of systems to adapt to the daily threats and extreme events, such as conflict and the impacts of climate change. The Food System Summit, the UN Secretary General talked yesterday of shock-proofing food systems against conflict or climate emergencies, the threefold need to protect human health and well-being, the planet, and to build prosperity. Now, the aim of this session is twofold, to provide strategic directions for regional and global discussions in different dryland regions, and to validate proposed solutions and transformative actions to build climate-resilient drylands, um, while ensuring food and nutritional security. It also aims to foster a sense of community by bringing together regional actors, local stakeholders, and dryland experts to build upon game-changing solutions and SDGs 15, 16, 2, and 5. The structure of our session is inspired by a joint paper written by FAO, the CGIAR, and CARE 
that focuses on what can be done to tackle the multi-dimensional nature of climate-related risks in drylands, humanitarian issues, development issues, and peace-building issues. It argues for prioritizing inclusive adaptation to climate change, which is sensitive to conflict, that integrates food security and climate mitigation, and is driven by good monitoring systems. Now, gender and indigenous people and social protection are included as cross-cutting issues. And the paper aims to discuss the relevance of promoting integrated programming including the humanitarian responses so, so that they can minimize the threat of the climate, the, the, the threat multiplier of climate change. The paper will address the impact of humanitarian activities on the environment and the effectiveness of dryland ecosystem services. So to not lose track of time, let's kick off the panel discussion. The first speaker today is Peter Laderach, the leader of the CGIAR Climate Security. He's currently also seconded um, to the United Nations World Food Program as principal climate scientist. As conflicts grow increasingly protracted and climate related shocks are more intense, resources in dryland regions become scarcer. There's a cycle of fragility, vulnerability, and the exacerbation of conflict. While humanitarian and peace-related interventions are often most urgent, longer-term investment is needed to provide durable solutions. This means that humanitarian development and peace interventions must take place in a more coordinated manner. So Peter, how can one ensure that a project will maximize both the short-term and the longer term positive impacts? And how, in your opinion, may one ensure to include conflict sensitivity at the core of project implementation? The floor is yours. Thank you, Duncan. Excellent question. Also your uh, previous introduction and Salamol's uh, introduction gives me a uh, good space uh, to, to talk here. So of course we're in the, in the week of the Food Systems Summit. So I'd like to frame my thinking a bit uh, around uh, the food system summit and and uh, around food systems and uh, looking at it uh, systematically as you were also referring to in in the introduction so it's a, a complex issue and we have to look at, at it uh, in a systems perspective so so let me maybe uh, talk about three aspects uh, first uh, food systems and climate and then secondly the food systems for peace in a climate crisis, and then third, really come to the more programmatic um, recommendations or thoughts uh, along the humanitarian development peace nexus. So, so first of all, uh, just a, a week ago, we also launched uh, another report that was called Climate Action to Transform Food Systems, because we, we saw that um, the discourses of the, the COP26 and the UN Food Systems Summit are not very much aligned and really we need to bring the climate and the food systems aspect agenda and dialogues together because they're so interrelated and and it's part of the same same problem just to to mention a, a few aspects here of course um, climate is threatening our food systems right we know about crop failures uh, floods droughts uh, which has uh, then implications, of course, on food security, on, on, on famine, on, on many of those aspects. But then on the other hand, food systems are also key to tackle the climate crisis, because we know that um, a large part of the emissions comes from expansion of agricultural lands, from deforestation, from unsustainable uh, management of uh, food systems. So, so those two uh, issues really have to be tackled jointly, otherwise it's Im impossible to solve. So, um, so I invite you to, to, to read that uh, paper also. And then if we think about the uh, food systems for, since we agree now, hopefully everybody, uh, since this week that food system is kind of the, the center of what we do here on the planet and everything links somewhat to the, the food system. So then what is the, 
what are food systems for peace in a climate crisis? So, so um, if we if we look at um, so we we reviewed um, different um, okay. Let me let me first start that that these linkages of uh, of climate security and, and and food system is only being made uh, now. I mean, in the last uh, almost months or or years. No. So yesterday also the UN uh, Security Council talked about uh, the link of of climate and security. And earlier this year uh, the African African Union uh, put out a communique where they clearly stated that, that climate is impacting on security. So those linkages are now, now being more, uh, more and more recognized. Of course, it's not because previously maybe scientists tried to make this uh, direct link. So if, it, if it's too hot, then there's more conflict. I mean, sometimes they were able to show that, but, but then still, so what, right? So, so we really need to look at it as a, Kind of causal impact pathway. So I guess we would all agree that that climate has an impact on food security, and we would all agree that food security has an impact on on conflict. So so those kind of uh, drivers and linkages. Uh, but then what we see at policy level. So when we reviewed, for example, the Copenhagen, Cancun, Paris Accords. So 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 there's there's no uh, link between climate and security. So this is, is still lacking, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. If we then go and uh, look in the, in the field uh, around finance, so we can see that the uh, humanitarian development, peace, adaptation objectives are often not aligned and, and actors and agencies, they compete for resources while, while all, all those things could be somewhat aligned no? to, to have a double dividend uh, peace and adaptation, for example. And then, um, the, finally, we also see, for example, that sometimes climate adaptation programming has a negative impact on peace. So, so it can create uh, grievances, it can create insecurity, and of course, that's what that's the, the least that, that we want to want to see, right? So then, maybe coming to the third topic, to the to the programming along the humanitarian development peace nexus. So I must emphasize it's to transform food systems, right? We don't want to because sometimes we, we say build back, okay, we say build back better, but I mean, we really need to transform because food systems, broken food systems, I mean, they haven't been great to start with, right? So we need to transform those. We don't wanna just rebuild them back to, to fragile food systems. And so in that sense, um, so maybe some, some examples how this could work along the humanitarian development and, and peace nexus. So how we can, can bridge that, right? So, so many of us, of course, know about, um, for example, the example of forecast-based finance, right? That is uh, used in uh, humanitarian programming where um, climate information is used to anticipate droughts and then pre-position food or finance so that when the drought hits, the impact will be less severe, less costly, less fatalities, right? But but we could now think of why don't we? Of course, that I mean that's that's already great, right? Then rather than responding to preposition and anticipate and and act early, but we could also use that now, as I was saying before, trans to transform food systems. So we could use those kind of schemes to then, for example, we could give. Uh, drought resistant seeds to farmers. We could give advice to farmers. We could, could give um, maybe fertilizer, maybe insurance, maybe other things to the farmers so that they don't, that they don't even um, end up in need of, of food or cash, right? So, so these are the, the kind of things that we're, that we're trying to, to find out. And I think, um, as I said in the beginning, climate action or climate programming has potential to, to transform those food systems and, and bridge this uh, humanitarian development and peace nexus. And, and then maybe, maybe another uh, point I was uh, talking about that often the objectives are not aligned, that, that there is competition for resources. And, and, but, but there is uh, examples that, that show that it, that it works. I mean, the CJR, for example, we work in, in Colombia. Uh, on, on value chains, on, on dairy value chains, but also um, food crop value chains. 
and and there they have uh, common objectives of uh, mitigation so of course uh, tree based systems they by definition uh, um, capture carbon but then also adaptation and also also peace building objectives right so so the idea is really to integrate those objectives and and then also have a better use of the the resources available and then um uh, just maybe a, a last point also again on, on finance, right? So of course uh, there's those pledges for the COP26 in, in, in Glasgow uh, in, in um, a few weeks that we hope that those hundred billion dollars uh, are gonna come around that everybody hopes. But, but, but then also a word of caution, right? Uh, if we get like all, the, all that money and it's gonna be flooded in those fragile uh, countries, I mean, there's a lot of harm that can be done. I, I referred to that previously, right? So the, the climate finance that can also cause uh, harm. So, so again, there we need to build in our uh, peace sensitive and responsive programming into the, into the adaptation and, and mitigation programming. So, so in summary, I mean, all those strings need to come together so that we have the double or triple dividend of adaptation, mitigation, peace, development, uh, humanitarian, and uh, of course it's complicated that's why, why we're saying we have to look at the, at the systems at the food systems uh, approach so it's 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 nothing nothing easy but um i i think that's that's what needs to be done um yeah i hope that was uh clear thank that you that was that was perfect peter thank you very much and you've really done a great job of laying out both the complexity of what needs to happen but also the fact that some of these elements are mutually reinforcing so if you if you get it right, you're you're both solving short term issues, but also building a secure future for the long term. Um, thanks very much. Um, and and now we're going to turn to Carl Deering, strategic partnerships lead, uh, food and water systems team at Care International USA. Carl has 23 years of experience in development, human development and humanitarian work, uh, with a focus on resilience food security and climate change. He's worked in refugee and post-conflict and development contexts in Asia and in East, West and Southern Africa. And his core interests are in equity and justice in food systems, gender equality and in the livelihood conservation nexus. He's currently strategic partnerships lead in CARE's food and water systems team. So um, Carl, can you say a little bit about the importance of inclusion of vulnerable groups in Nexus programming and perhaps describe CARE's experience and successful models in this area? And in your opinion, where does the humanitarian development piece Nexus and work fit in the wider food system summit discussions? And what opportunities do you see there for the future? Over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Duncan. There's quite a lot there, but I'll give it a go. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and um, I hope everybody is well. The, 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 with all of the sessions during the summit yesterday, there was one particular statement that struck me and that was a joint statement by the Food Security, Nutrition, Health and WASH clusters, uh, which which uh, stated that there are 41 million people at risk of imminent famine in 43 countries. Um, shocking statistics, and that's on top of the current uh, 750 odd million uh, that are already uh, chronically hunger, hungry. And when I looked at the data, I looked at the, the, the countries that were kind of isolated in that statement, uh, the worst case scenarios were all dry land scenarios. So this discussion couldn't be more pertinent and timely and urgent. And, and thanks for convening. The inclusion of, of, of vulnerable groups and vulnerable individuals is, um, is absolutely essential for any kind of success. And it's not just for success. It's also a question primarily of, of rights and justice. And I think that's a baseline. That's where we should be starting this conversation because uh, participation in human development is a human right. Um, um, 
participation in 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 of a, of an inclusion of, of, of vulnerable and marginalized groups is obviously uh, for lots of lots of reasons um capacity strengthening uh, and and building of confidence for example to be able to engage in, in decision making uh, and governance processes and to to assume leadership roles in 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 their own development um a couple of just a few areas i think that of are of interest and of relevance that I feel to this conversation, and where we've had some um, evidence of success based on on the application of different models. Are uh, I've got five of them actually, and I'll just spin through them quickly. One is analysis, and it might sound obvious, but unless we include vulnerable people in our analysis of their risks and vulnerabilities, we're not we're not going anywhere. And it's not simply about um, sitting down with a survey and, and asking them about their vulnerabilities it's actually it's actually doing analysis with them of their capacities as well as their vulnerabilities so we have a tool called the climate vulnerability and capacity analysis uh, manual which which essentially does that it's a, it's a rural appraisal tool but we sit with communities uh, to understand not just their vulnerabilities but the capacities that they have uh, and want to develop to manage those vulnerabilities, to overcome those vulnerabilities and manage the risks that they're facing. So their capacities to, to, to anticipate, their capacities to adapt, uh, the, their capacities to diversify. Another is planning. Um, it's possible to include, uh, and it should be mandatory, to include vulnerable individuals and groups in the way we plan and manage our interventions and that can be anything from village land use planning to community adaptation planning uh, to community land commissions or, or natural resource committees i mean these are things that um are are out there the models are there but they're not perhaps as systematically applied as we might as we might think they are another is learning um Participatory learning approaches and learning models are, are, are an extremely effective way of, of ensuring the inclusion of vulnerable groups and, and individuals. And I'm thinking about, for example, farmer field and business schools or pastoralist field schools um, or savings groups, village savings and loans associations, where you're not only building um, functional capacities and skills but you're also building social capital um, and i think that's a very very important and successful you know impactful way to include vulnerable groups and finally accountability um, this is this is where we all need to do better citizen-led accountability models um, we have something called community scorecards which is something that is a community-led a citizen-led way of holding uh, service providers and authorities to account in a non-confrontational way, in fact, in quite a constructive way, and it 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 works where um, communities set their own objectives um, and uh, together with with service providers and authorities, and 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 they hold uh, they hold each other accountable for their own performance, and that opens space for dialogue, for for improved governance and improved inclusion, and I think. That's something that the humanitarian development and peace nexus could be thinking more of and engaging particularly also with, with I think, ecosystems development actors and conservation actors, natural resource management actors. Um, uh, we're doing quite a bit of social accountability work with, with the World Wildlife Fund, for example, on that. Um, the, your second question is, is a great one, Duncan, about the relevance of the Food Systems Summit and where this nexus uh, fits in the bigger summit dialogue. And I think Peter, uh, covered it quite well as well. So I, I'll just compliment what he said. I think um, something that this nexus could consider, at least um, from my experience, and I've worked quite a lot with the Action Track 4 and Equitable Livelihoods during the summit process, and, and, and four or three or four of the big areas would be taking nature-based solutions and, and biodiversity protection a lot more seriously in the humanitarian development peace next nexus uh, we kind of assume it's there and it is there and we're doing a lot of i think good work in uh, in the dry lands on on ecosystems restoration but i think it can come into the center of the nexus a lot more um 
the integration of programming, Peter mentioned that, and I think more interministerial collaboration at national level is, is needed. Um, and I think the Food Systems Summit um, kind of went a long way to, to exposing that need. Human rights, I already mentioned rights, but I think um, there's, there's, there's more that the Nexus work could do to invoke human rights um, uh, for success and, and, and looking outside the box of humanitarian related rights or even natural resource rights, but, but the wider spectrum of environmental rights, the rights of minorities, the women's rights, uh, rights to social protection, rights to living incomes. These are all issues that I think the Nexus could consider. And finally, I would say putting small scale producers at the center, the centrality of small scale producers for food security, for nutrition, for, for, for resilience, for, for climate change adaptation. Um, they, are the, they are the best people at this. So uh, supporting their traditional knowledge networks, supporting their social learning, uh, supporting their adaptive capacities. Uh, and I would say particularly um, supporting efforts to advance uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women in drylands because um, there, there are huge, huge gaps in in the in in in, in access to resources uh, as well as the uh, realization of the rights of women. Um, so I'll leave it there, Duncan. There, there are just a few reflections from the from the summit process. Thank you so much, Carl. I mean, I think those give us a really you know, good trajectory and direction, putting nature solutions more seriously, integrating programming between ministries, more of a focus on human rights, and then your, your point about the centrality of smallholder producers, small scale producers, and particularly women, I think real, really important points. So thank you. Um, well, let's move on to the next discussion about how we can integrate measures to facilitate, facilitate climate change adaptation and food and nutrition security um, towards obviously ensuring environmental sustainability and overall human security. And for this topic, we have the pleasure to hear from Ms. Nada El Aguizi, who currently heads the Sustainable Development and International Cooperation Department at the League of Arab States. She joined the League in 1992 and has more than 20 years of experience in economic and social development at the regional and international levels. Ms. Nada unfortunately could not join us today as she's flying back from a forum in Dubai, but she kindly shared a recording of her remarks regarding the importance of establishing a regional advocacy platform and commitment in order to achieve local transformational change. In a region that has witnessed widespread conflicts, like the Arab region, conflict affected countries face a range of unique context specific challenges that constrain both capacities and resources and prevent development gains. The situation in many places is stark. If this trend continues, it'll be impossible to meet targets of say the 2030 development agenda, even those relating to basic needs. In the recent regional report published by the League of Arab States and its partners, it highlighted that the links between conflict and development are not linear. The provision of aid is a temporary relief that cannot substitute for long-term su sustainable solutions. So Nada, how uh, can development interventions be tailored to the national and subnational context to facilitate the climate change adaptation and food nutritional security towards ensuring environmental sustainability and overall human security? I'll let you answer that by video. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mafin. Uh, thank you, Fao, for inviting me to this uh, important uh, uh, discussion side event. Um, I, I had to. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I, I was not able to be with you today, but I had to uh, record this message to you because uh, I had another commitment uh, in the back. So uh, this session will uh, discuss the importance of uh, the complementarity actions uh, between uh, the, the ecosystems 
and the importance of adaptation efforts to climate change. Uh, and I would, I would like to give an example on this uh, very vital issue uh, when it comes to uh, the region, the Arab region, which has, which lacks uh, natural resources and uh, suffers uh, from uh, a lot of extreme events and, uh, and uh, scarcity of water, arid uh, lands, and uh, many other challenges in this regard. So uh, to give you uh, an example of uh, the efforts of the League of Arab States uh, in this regard, uh, I would like to um, uh, shed some light on a report that we have uh, released uh, uh, recently uh, in the Arab League. Uh, it was a joint effort between the League of Arab States and a number of uh, UN partners uh, like uh, the uh, ESQA and the IOM and also uh, the Trust Fund for Human Security in New York. Um, there was also a regional task force uh, which included uh, UN and non-UN partners such as uh, FAO, UNDP, and WFP. And uh, also uh, inputs were um, provided uh, through e-consultations with the government officials, with policymakers, uh, UN uh, resident coordinators, uh, civil society, private sector, uh, all, all relevant stakeholders uh, had some input uh, in this report. Uh, this report uh, echoed the five pillars of uh, the 2030 agenda, namely peace, people, planet, prosperity and partnership. Uh, it calls for an integrated framework uh, to advan advance the SDGs uh, in countries faced with complex and uh, recurring challenges related to planning, programming, prioritization, and resources. Um, it, uh, it is essential uh, here to uh, give the example of, uh, of the number uh, of countries that were uh, uh, pointing case of this report which are eight countries, uh, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, natural resources and environment uh, play various roles across conflict cycles and uh, development uh, trajectories. Uh, as a region, uh, Arab countries are naturally affected by uh, difficult climate conditions and high temperatures and scarce groundwater and rainfall. Uh, countries in the Arab region are increasingly uh, vulnerable to climate change and the countries of concern in this report uh, were no exception. For instance, Iraq uh, combines arid and semi-arid conditions with the alluvial uh, ecosystem formed by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and highland uh, areas. Lebanon uh, has Mediterranean climatic conditions that vary between the mountain and the coastal region of the country. Syria combines uh, Mediterranean conditions with arid and semi-arid uh, areas and is also part of the ecoregion uh, formed by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Libya and Jordan have mostly vast extensions of arid or semi-arid uh, terrains. Somalia, Sudan and Yemen combine arid and semi-arid areas with equatorial and tropical conditions. So despite the distinct features of environmental and climate conditions in the countries of concern, they share common climate change and adaptation challenges. The combination of demographic pressure, increasing uh, water scarcity and climate change has put increasing strain on the ecosystems of all countries. Therefore, the role of healthy ecosystems and adaptation and interlinkages in sustaining peace is recognized in the 2030 agenda. As uh, conflicts are triggered, exacerbated, or prolonged by competition over scarce uh, resources, and climate change will only make the situation worse. So, uh, also to give you an idea about the key findings of uh, this report, uh, there were five uh, key recommendations that came out uh, from this report. One, understanding the interconnectedness of the 2030 agenda. 
uh, to addressing the vulnerabilities and uh, eliminating exclusion uh, is key to achieving the SDGs in conflict affected countries. Three, achieving SDGs should consider a universal yet context contextual approach. Four, adopting a common vision to achieve collective outcomes. Uh, five, overcoming uh, data constraints is key to understanding SDG progress. Uh, and now we're planning uh, to implement and mainstream the key findings of, uh, of this report through a mechanism that we intend to establish by the end of this year uh, with the support of our uh, partners and uh, to benefit from the collective uh, repository of tools and approaches to overcome the obstacles um, and to uh, have joint analysis and planning and programming, as well as support uh, country-specific prioritization and harmonize efforts to localize national development uh, plans and tackle the interrelated challenges uh, between poverty, vulnerability, inequality, exclusion, and displacement. So again, the efforts will build on the findings of, uh, of the report and uh, will pave the way to working together uh, for the benefit of this region. Uh, and again, here I would like to stress uh, that the importance of the interlinkages between climate change and peace and how to harmonize them is key to achieve stability uh, in the region. Thank you again for having me and wishing you a successful event. Thank you, Ms. Nada, and, and drawing out the message that although there are distinct features of these different countries, there are common challenges needing a common vision that sees the interlinkages between climate change and, and peace building. Well, now let's um, move to FAO's Fida Haddad, who has more than 20 years experience in the interface of dry land natural resource management. She has extensive experience in managing projects and initiatives involving public policy development, building local institutions, and the incorporation of social and gender issues into resilience and development. Fida holds an MSc from Derby University on environmental management and climate change. And before joining FAO, Fida was leading the regional dry land and livelihood programs for IUCN West Asia Regional Office. She's now leading the team in developing the Dryland Restoration Initiative platform, DRIP, and serves as secretary to the Committee on the Forestry Working Group on Dryland Forests and agro silvopastoral Systems. One of the key recommendations of the paper you co-wrote is the importance of establishing participatory monitoring and procedures at the start of every program. So, um, Fida, how, in your opinion, will this, along with an HDP, Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus approach, contribute to achieving the 2030 Agenda, as well as other global commitments, such as the UN Decade of Action? Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Duncan. It's indeed true that um, most of dryland countries are facing a double-headed problem, as you mentioned. So on the one end, it's visible through their climate change vulnerability, Whereas on the other side, we see conflict as well as either protected or environmental crisis. And this puts major stress on achieving the SDGs. These, all these issues are especially evident in dryland forests and their aggressive pastoral systems, where deforestation and land degradation are the ongoing and neglected concerns in many conflict affected and post conflict interventions. And this is the benefit of taking the humanitarian development peace approach for dry land resilience building, which can do two things in parallel. First, you need the humanitarian actors to respond to emergency needs and the development actions to address the longer term vulnerability and risk reduction measures in this area, particularly in the case of conflict. So to bridge the gap between humanitarian aid, resilience and development activities, there is a need to plan, monitor, and track the different intervention and design the do no harm social and environmental interventions. 
And this needs a fundamental structural shift, actually, that have implication of how different actors work together and how aid is planned and financed. There is no more time to, to invest in um, short value chains without environmental lens um, or on sustaining the, the environmental peace lens, actually. So the, the monitoring purposes that need to be happened at different level by different actors. So policymakers, when policymakers use the best available evidence to help make policy decision, the real impact can be achieved. At the same time, there is a need to increase the awareness and understanding for, with, for different actors on the linkages between short and long term climate trends, land degradation, resource scarcity, and offering more information and access actually to climate information service and early warning system. There can be, of course, a lot of benefits and at the, at the same level, households can become more empowered and can make investment decision and protect their livelihood while reducing the vulnerability to shock. And this can be seen in the example uh, case of Cox Bazaar. For without the prioritization of environmental security alongside human security, there would not have been sufficient renewable natural resources to meet requirements for energy and cooking needs. And when we looked into that case, we found that the key success factor was the participatory monitoring approach that deployed key technological resources like remote sensing, geospatial analysis, to conduct resource assessment to green the humanitarian aids. So, of course, as, as of course mentioned by, um, by Peter and Carl on the key of building the capacity and awareness of host communities and refugees, different actors are needed to meet food security and the nutritional needs as well. So the joint paper that we're planning to launch, uh, that FAO is planning to launch with CARE and CGIR, we found that the key to applying the humanitarian nexus, the humanitarian development peace nexus actually, is in thinking about how each of the components mentioned like by, by, my, by the respective panelists on, on inclusive, on monitoring, um, on uh, uh, adaptation to climate change, and even monitoring can be combined to strengthen the overall approach and outcome rather than disaggregating these areas. So for example, most of the cases we found highlight how the combination of addressing immediate needs in terms of humanitarian while empowering people to build capacity and addressing new adaptation challenges in terms of development in a way which account for existing and, and potential tension without within the local context in terms of peace can deliver, deliver more effective outcomes of the a, um, aid intervention as well as development intervention. And the good, good opportunity now is with the food summit, uh, with the food summit coalition and initiatives. We know that the food summit process has given rise to several multi-stakeholders initiatives that actors will be ready to comment after 18 months uh, of a remarkable global engagement. The building resilience to vulnerabilities, shocks, and stress action areas provide potential coalition and initiatives, mainly fighting food crisis along the humanitarian development peace nexus, which, which will give more area or arena to explore collaboration with think tanks and local organization in how to support member states in achieving their 2030 agenda. And of course, um, one last point that there is a need and urgent need to promote more innovative integrated approach and the transformational action and share best practices. So this is what we are planning to continue to do with these kinds of coalition and initiatives. And the next, our next stop will be um, further elaboration from the cases on the ground and discuss it during the upcoming World Forestry Congress, um, which will be held uh, next uh, May 2020 in Korea. And we need um, different actors to combine the recommendation and their support to, sub, to, 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 to reshape how the world's forest, trees outside the forest in Triland can be sustained and part of the um, conflict intervention 
and post-conflict intervention to sustain the ecosystem services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fida. And I do uh, urge people to read those very 18 very interesting cases uh, when that report comes out. And thank you for you and your colleagues from CGIAR and, and CARE for co-producing that discussion paper that led us to this event today. Well, now we are transitioning to our action on the ground segment, um, illustrating the potential country level act application of the humanitarian development peace nexus approach um, in dryland regions and concretely we're going to learn about two flagship uh, programs integrated impact programs um, global environmental facility uh, program on food systems land use and restoration which is commonly known as folor ip and the second one is the Dryland Sustainable Landscapes, DSLIP, operating in 27 and 11 countries, respectively. So these are big new impact programs, although they're not designed specifically to address the HDP nexus, both program structures will facilitate a contribution to the emerging themes that we've heard about today. So I'm pleased to introduce William Sutton, Global Lead for the Climate Smart Agriculture and Team Leader for the GEF, the GEF 7 Food Systems Land Use and Restoration Impact Programme. And also Fritjof Burstler, who's Senior Natural Resources Officer and Global Programs Coordinator of the GEF 7 Dryland Sustainable Landscapes uh, Impact Programme from FAO to introduce, the, the speakers will introduce the two uh, programs. Um, and the joint presentation has two parts. Uh, Bill will start by providing an overview of FOLOR, followed by Fritjof presenting the DSL while establishing potential linkages to the humanitarian development and peace nexus themes. So over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, thank you, colleagues, and, and welcome to everyone in the audience. Uh, I'm excited to be here today representing uh, Fuller and the World Bank. Uh, we have just a, a few slides to share with you today, if you will, uh, Fritjof. So to start with, just a little bit of background on the global environmental challenges that are driven by unsustainable land use that uh, really motivated the development of the, the Fuller Impact Program. First of all, the World Bank, along with our, our colleagues in, in FAO, in the different UN agencies in the CGIAR, we're all working to try to help countries achieve uh, SDG2 on zero hunger by 2030. At the same time, Doing that, it's kind of like hitting a moving target because we know that the world population is growing at the same time. It's expected to grow to nearly 10 billion people by 2050. And meanwhile, uh, the middle class is growing, people's diets are changing and, and relying more heavily on animal proteins. So this is causing significant uh, hidden environmental costs or negative environmental externalities that are estimated at up to $12 trillion a year from our food system and from related land use change issues. For one thing, agriculture causes about 80% of deforestation in the world. In turn, forests host around 80% of global biodiversity and the forest loss is putting that biodiversity at risk. And at the same time, food systems, along with the closely related sectors of forestry, deforestation, and land use change are responsible for approximately a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions. So increasing production significantly in this context using a business as usual approach is simply going to exacerbate these problems and add to those substantial hidden environmental costs. 
So as we've heard from um, other speakers, uh, something needs to be done about this, and it requires not just incremental changes at the margin, but a transformation of the global food system. Next, please, Fritjo. In response, uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about a, a new uh, global program, the GEF-7 Financed Food Systems Land Use and Restoration Impact Program, or Fuller IP. The Fuller IP is a global program designed for transformative results. Uh, the Fuller Impact Program was designed um, and is financed by um, uh, GEF and implemented in collaboration with the World Bank and, and other organizations. The overall goal is to promote sustainable, integrated landscapes and efficient food value and supply chains at scale. The Impact Program consists of two main components. First is the Fuller Global Platform, which is led by the World Bank. The aim of the global platform is to support transformational shifts in the use of environmentally sustainable practices and policies for priority global value chains. It's focused on things like uh, capacity strengthening, policy engagement, both with the, the public and, and private sectors, and strategic knowledge management. Uh, the, then there are uh, the four country child projects. There are approximately, there are 27 uh, now country child projects that are at different stages of approval and they're implemented by eight different implementing agencies and uh, covering eight commodity value chains. I don't, can, can everyone see the bottom of the, the slide or? And on my screen, it's cut off. Is it is it possible to somehow okay zoom? I don't know out a little bit for each other. I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, the the I, I have the presentation anyway. The uh, Fuller Global Platform and the the Country Child Projects are supported by a total of approximately three hundred million dollars in grants from the Global Environment Facility. The Global Platform um, is financed by about a $29 million grant, and the Country Child Projects are financed by approximately $270 million in grants, which works out to an average of about $10 million per country. Um, together, that $300 million in grant resources is expected to leverage an additional $2.7 billion in co-financing. That's co-financing from the, the um, countries themselves, their governments, from agencies like the World Bank, from uh, the private sector. Together, uh, this $3 billion program has the following envis envisioned results. Uh, first of all, uh, sustainable food systems promoted, Second, deforestation-free supply chains promoted. Third, landscape scale restoration for production and ecosystem services promoted. And fourth, uh, reduced negative environmental externalities. Next slide, please. So th this um, map has a lot of information um, and it's intended to give you kind of an overview of the, the scope and scale and reach of the Fuller Impact Program along with the different agencies involved. As you can see, um, the, the program, the 27 country projects have a, a very diverse distribution uh, across the globe, across regions. Um, some of the, the biggest agricultural producers in the world in, in each of these regions from China to India to, to Nigeria to Brazil and Mexico. It also covers uh, eight commodity value chains that uh, are really the most important value chains, both in terms of food security and nutrition for uh, the population, and also in terms of, uh, unfortunately, those negative environmental externalities and the, the commodity value chains are cocoa, coffee, 
corn, livestock, palm, rice, soy, and wheat. And the uh, 27 country projects are implemented by eight different implementing agencies. The overall effort is led by the World Bank, but the implementing agencies also include Conservation International, FAO, EFAD, UNDP, UNEP, uh, UNIDO, and WWF. So um, that gives you an overview and um, we'd be happy to provide additional information. This is a new program. The global platform was just approved last year and the 27 country projects are still uh, in the process of, of getting final approval from the GEF. The program is expected to run for a total of seven years. So I'd like to hand it over now to uh, my friend Fritjof. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bill, and uh, greetings to everyone from Rome, FAO Rome. So it's a real pleasure to be part of this important uh, side event. And just uh, to add, so the Folio Impact Program presented now by Bill is one of three impact programs that the GF has initiated in its uh, seventh replenishment. There's an impact program on sustainable cities, and then there's an impact program on sustainable forest management, which includes dryland's sustainable landscapes. And that is a program I will talk about now. Um, all of the programs, just perhaps to add, um, aim at a more systemic and integrated approach to tackle drivers of environmental degradation more directly and not just the uh, symptoms. As we could see in Bill's presentation, the FOLO is really addressing spatial as well as um, vertical dimensions of the food chain. Um, so switching over now to the Dryland Sustainable Landscape Impact Program, DSLIP in short. So there are lots of impact programs, we need abbreviations. Um, the program's overarching goal is um, basically, and also the corresponding objective is to achieve land degradation neutrality in poverty stricken and uh, fragile dryland areas. This is very much in close alignment with the UN uh, CCD land degradation neutrality framework. And the program will in particular address the very complex, complex nexus that we heard about um, earlier of livelihoods and environment in the targeted drylands. Uh, this will be achieved by reducing vulnerabilities uh, while improving local livelihoods through sustainable landscape management, but also the promotion uh, of selected dryland uh, commodities. Uh, so you can see there are a lot of uh, similarities with the FULO program. Um, the IP is, of course, smaller. FULO is uh, basically uh, the biggest program uh, that the GF launched um, since the start. So here we have 104 million US dollars, substantial also of GF grant financing combined with 810 million US dollar of co-financing. We have a total of 11 countries uh, that directly participate in this program across three different um, regions, dryland regions. Here we have the Myombo Mopane ecosystem of Southern Africa, where we also have the majority of projects um, located. We have the savannas of East and West Africa included, and the temperate uh, grassland savannas, uh, and also shrublands of um, Central Asia. The IAP is uh, similar to the uh, FOLUA program. The DSLIP is also equipped with a global coordination project. That's something that um, I call it the new generation of Jeff projects. So each of uh, the past integrated approaches uh, or impact programs now in Jeff 7 are equipped with such a coordination part, um, which is to increase the overall scale of the impact by providing effective coordination, first of all, building capacities, especially around identified, and it was mentioned before, the, the common management challenges. That's very important because there are many in violence that can be clustered. And of course, a very effective uh, knowledge transfer and adaptive learning on evidence-based good practices. Uh, basically, it's to ensure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, key partners of the program are three GEF implementing agency. We have the World Bank, um, ICN, and WWF, in addition to other partners such as WOCAT, the UNCCD Global Mechanism, and UN Environment. Uh, besides a range of region-specific partners and also selected knowledge hubs that I will refer to uh, in a minute. 
uh, dryland uh, potential to contribute to global environmental benefits. Global env environmental benefits is hugely underestimated. So we can see here the program's ambitious targets that um, just to indicate GEBs, global environmental benefits, uh, are included in all the JEF projects. This is basically all programs are geared towards that. So here we can see the targets of the DSLIP impact program, uh, very ambitious, but uh, this is, of course, a time frame of uh, the next five to six years that uh, we try to achieve that. And the impact uh, will go beyond the 11 countries mentioned as we have the ambition to scale out. Um, we talk about common management challenges that are region specific. We have uh, talk about evidence good practices that can be shared uh, with neighboring countries and regions. Um, and this will be facilitated by the global coordination project and the regional exchange mechanisms that we will establish. So as Bill mentioned, similar to the FOLU, the DSLIP global coordination project and majority of country projects were CEO endorsed, uh, donor endorsed uh, in June this year. So we are still in the starting phase. There's not a lot we can present uh, in terms of results from the ground, but um, we thought it's important to provide you with information on the overall approach, possible synergies, um, so we can look uh, into that right from the beginning to ensure the expected um, impact at scale. So when we talk about drylands, and I mean, that was also mentioned by Duncan in the opening, um, there are figures that everyone might be aware about in terms of the extent of, of dryland ecosystems. Um, but what is often forgotten or not even now and in many cases is the fact that drylands contain 44% of the world's agricultural land and supply over 60% of the world's food production. So it's therefore not surprising that the majority of the FOLUR uh, country projects are located in uh, dryland regions, as we can see here, except for Southeast Asia. So from that perspective, we already overlap. There's a clear overlap between the two programs and room to create synergies uh, from a geographic and eco-region point of view. Uh, here I'm just showing the DSLIP countries in red, might be a bit difficult to distinguish, but we have uh, a total of three countries that actually participate in both programs. Um, so also from a thematic uh, point of view, and I'm closing the loop a little bit now uh, towards the humanitarian development peace nexus as much as I can. Um, we have very similar um, opportunities between the programs uh, to create synergies as well as to contribute to the HDP. So both IPs operate uh, at the productive um, landscape level and follow a programmatic approach, which means that all the national projects in both programs follow the same overall um, framework for the interventions. Um, that has many advantages, especially when we talk about common management challenges, which I will illustrate um, in the following. So under component one, countries in both programs follow an integrated landscape approach. Uh, so here we embrace uh, the complexity of the landscapes in both programs, which is also needed to achieve the anticipated results. We heard a lot about integration, holistic approaches, so the landscape is one of them. And this approach comprises of uh, comprehensive and integrated landscape assessment approaches um, for more informed decision making, but also, and that's very important, um, an inclusion or inclusive multi-stakeholder collaboration approach to enable joint planning and also joint decision making. So a large number of um, stakeholders that operate in the landscape, as we know, it ranges from private, public sector, civil society, and, um, and also the land users um, have uh, different interests. Um, they often uh, conflict, of course, uh, the interest. In addition, landscape planning approaches often do not consider the needs of the most vulnerable in the landscape and also the marginalized um, land users, uh, including tenure and access rights. So we as FAO and uh, partners involved will support country projects by developing uh, so-called community of practice on integrated landscape uh, management and inclusive multi-stakeholder approaches. Uh, and again, this can be applied in both impact programs. There's a lot of room for cross-pollination here. And hence also contributing uh, to the HDP nexus. We have two themes here, which is inclusion and conflict uh, sensitivity. 
Component two, in turn, uh, for both programs will be informed, of course, by the results of component one, the assessment work, uh, and uh, which is in many cases an integrated land use uh, plan. And we focus mainly on sustainable production practices and standards. Um, of course, value chains and supply chains are also incorporated, incorporated but I just want to focus on the production standards standards which have an aim to sustainably in intensify um, climate smart agriculture production as a whole while safeguarding uh, vital ecosystem services in the targeted landscape. Uh, and also here, um, FAO in close partnership with WOCAD, UNCCD and the World Bank will develop a community of practice for the application of evidence-based good SLM practices. Of course, they are um, region and land use specific, uh, but can be widely shared. And uh, perhaps just to add on that, because Carl mentioned that in his, uh, in his um, remarks, um, it's very important to have a vehicle on the ground to apply SLM practices. Most of them are cross-sectoral. Um, so the farmer feed school and Abu pastoral feed school approach mentioned by Carl is something that um, we use in many of the countries uh, as part of an evidence-based participatory um, approach. And also in this case, the results of the intervention will directly contribute uh, to the other HDP Nexus theme, which is resilience with climate food security. And uh, lastly, component three will focus on monitoring, knowledge management, and adaptive learning by basically also informing um, the other two components, component one and two, uh, providing room for adaptive management. Uh, and uh, reflective learning. Um, as part of the comprehensive monitoring tools that we apply, there, there are a number of them. I mean, the integrated landscape assessment is part of it, but we also apply um, a tool to assess the resilience of farmers and pastoralists at um, the household level to climate change, hence also contributing to the HDP overall uh, monitoring theme. So both impact programs, that's also important. We talk about partnerships and um, alliances. So here we have a package already, you know, that we bring along. Um, both programs are not operating in silos. They're leveraging on a large consortium of uh, partners. Uh, in the case of the DSLRP, if we can see, see here, um, we focus on, on regional specific partners, um, you know, to provide the necessary outreach and platforms to upscale, upscale intervention at the, at the regional level. Um, here, again, referring to common management challenges, they are region specific, so this would make sense. Um, so also neighboring countries can benefit from that. Um, at the same time, um, we have a, a suit of uh, knowledge hubs that uh, uh, part and parcel of the DSLRP, as we can see here, uh, to support the development of commun community of practices as well as um, intergovernmental committees, just a snapshot on that. And this whole approach is the same for the FOLO impact program, as also highlighted by Bill. Uh, the FOLO IP will also leverage on uh, ongoing work uh, with existing multi stakeholder uh, commodity round tables, is one example. Um, which will allow the program to work on the demand side. Um, of course, this will also have a, a positive impact um, in, to incentivize the um, uh, production side in terms of the sustainable standards that can be introduced. Uh, and the platforms will also help to upscale to other regions. An example is the Sustainable, sustainable Rice Landscape Initiative. Uh, which is very much interested uh, also to partner with African rice producing countries. And with this, uh, with this also extending sustainable rice production practices in, uh, to other regions. And in addition, uh, as mentioned by Bill, uh, there's already a consortium of partners that um, the FOLO will move along. Some of it uh, is sort of carrying over from the JEF-6 integrated approach pilots, um, and that will as a whole also contribute to the effectiveness uh, of the global support uh, component. So just lastly, um, I would like to con uh, Just one minute, Fritjof. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready now, it's the last slide, but it's the most important ones. <laughs> it's just to indicate that um, the program is not only contributing to the UN um, Food System Summit Action Area 
four, but also the other three action areas, it's very important, as well as the collision of partners that uh, are established, and also to the game-changing solutions, you know, that, uh, that will be developed. Hence, contributing uh, to global environmental benefits, targeted SDGs, as well as other initiatives, such as the UN Decade on Ecosystem um, Restoration. So thank you, Duncan. Sorry for taking a bit longer, and over to you. Thank you very much, um, Bill and Fritjof, for, for presenting those two programs. And they are big and, and relatively new and exciting programs. Um, so it's good to hear about them. Potential not only to contribute um, to the HDP Nexus approach under the UN Food System Summit Action Area 4, but also the other action areas, as you showed on that last slide. Um, now, uh, we had planned uh, for a, 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 an intervention session um, where we've not got as much time as we would have thought for that, but I would encourage participants, please, to. Uh, focus in uh, uh, on the questions that we asked earlier. Are the recommendations just mentioned applicable? What key actions are required to strengthen resilience of dry land food systems? So where should the priorities be for strengthening uh, the resilience? Who should the main actors be and what's the missing piece? So if you want to make a contribution, please do write in the chat box and we'll keep and record those. Uh, and 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 get get the panelists to to respond to them if if you leave your emails. Um, there were a couple of questions already asked in the in the session, um, and and I'll just turn to one of those. And it was I think it was addressed to to Fida, um, and it was the question of how do you cope with underfunding of humanitarian responses if you're trying to get this longer term vision this integration of humanitarian development and peace building, what happens if the money is not there to even cope with the humanitarian response? Well, um, it's, it's really very, very difficult to question, but um, the point is the complementarity is around the complementarity. Of course, um, I'm not in a position to, to explain how the funding options or how the fundings flow with the with the humanitarian aids how it works and of course the shortfall always um, is there but the complementarity where the 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 activities the humanitarian activities if if have from the beginning the angle of sustainability, this means that you can complement with other activities on the ground. So the examples, for, exa for example, the, the, the impact programs just mentioned by Fritjof and William are a key to explain how this can be happened. So it's not just to, 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 to spread the money, you need to, to to work on the enabling environment. You need to engage with the different actors partners and put the plan together to move forward. So the shortage in humanitarian, even if it's from the global funding for the humanitarian is so difficult, it can be happened by engaging with the communities with the different actors at the ground while doing such complementarity. But um, the, the point of uh, having like more funds, of course, that's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a big issue now. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Fida. And and we've got a, a related discussion going on on the on the chat. Uh, just bring that in. Um, it's it's a question about the focus uh, in the food system summit. I think on the on the uh, chronic hunger and not acute hunger. Now you'll have to excuse me because I'm not an expert on these areas. But um, uh, there was a question for Carl, um, which was just. He, Carl's responded and he was saying, in fact, the solutions only identify development solutions within humanitarian contexts. It's not meeting people's immediate humanitarian needs. So, Carl, do you want to just respond to that, if you might? Well, I, I, thanks. Thanks, Duncan. I think uh, I'm not familiar with the HTV Nexus cluster within Action Track 5. I think that's where the question is coming from because I haven't been on that cluster or that Action Track. So if 
indeed, as the question as Pat is saying that that it's to, it's addressing acute needs in development context rather than humanitarian context, and that is a gap, absolutely, and that cluster uh, needs to uh, you know that that needs to be addressed somehow, um, ideally in that cluster and elsewhere across the action tracks. Um, I think particularly action track one, they did uh, talk about acute hunger. But um, if it's not manifest in any of the cluster solutions, then that that is indeed a gap. Thanks. No, that's that's useful feedback. We Maybe probably... I, can, I can propose if uh, I think we have Christina or Pat from uh, the action area five mm -hmm. among the audience. Maybe I don't know if you are still there. Maybe they can step in and provide some. Uh, background on, on this work if it's so uh, yeah I think yeah she's typing in Christina I think great so uh, if if, uh, if you want Christina we can give you the mic okay yeah thank you so much uh, yeah, this is so you. nice <laughs> can you hear me yes we can hear you fine yes oh Oh, we've lost you now, though. Do you hear me now? Yes. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I, I was really enjoying every second of this uh, webinar. Congratulations to all of you. And of course, we wanted to, uh, to invite you to join uh, the alliance. Uh, it's, it's, it's an alliance, it's a broad alliance that is uh, looking into climate change adaptation and mitigation, the nexus. And we have a special uh, uh, focus on vulnerable and at risk areas. Some of them uh, are I mean, some of them are focused on the arid, semi-arid lands, uh, also the Sahel. And we have some solutions that are already uh, that were, you know, like uh, bottom up initiating uh, the way that we are working. Uh, another uh, another areas uh, at risk and uh, vulnerable countries are all the seeds. We are trying to engage. Uh, um, most of them and least uh, developed countries as well. Um, having said that, I, I am excited to see that you are uh, producing this uh, information because at the IPCC, we have been uh, um, trying to, uh, to include, I mean, it has closed already uh, because, you know, seven years past, uh, they fly. It has just closed, uh, but we managed uh, to, to include the concept of the humanitarian development and peace nexus uh, of course, that was a draft. We don't know um, the final uh, outcome, but the concept is there. Uh, what we were missing were more publications. And the way, um, and we have a paper that will be published soon, the, the way that uh, we have been uh, framing uh, the, the, the nexus and how we were trying to, to include it, it was um, when looking at multisectorial uh, climate adaptation for food security and nutrition, we were also looking at the feasibility and effectiveness assessments of the adaptation options and several cross-sectoral enables. Some of them, they were, uh, you have mentioned, I think, well, all of them, education, I, women and I, rights, and I, one sorry, of I, Yes. I just intervened. I suppose it's specific, our specific point was yes. that, that there is no humanitarian um, solutions within the nexus. They're development long-term approaches because they're based mm -hmm. on the world, the, the, one of the key recommendations yeah. of, of the World Humanitarian Summit in 2015. Yes. The problem is that meeting people's immediate needs, uh -huh. like it's, it's clear from earlier on in the interventions, humanitarian intervention needs to be short term, but it needs, to, that's in the ideal situation. Yes. <laughs> but when you have an underfunded system whereas 40 to 60% of humanitarian response plans are not met, mm -hmm. underfunded. And there's also, there's, so that's one point. And I think secondly, we think hum all humanitarian funding, but there's a huge issue with the, how we, how the interventions are monitored, how, what value, how, how we can be more e efficient. So the problem is that within the food system summit, we haven't looked at people's immediate needs. That's a great resilience. I think that's a really good point, Pat, and 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 one we've we'll register and and perhaps make as a, a main 
kind of point in taking this forward. Um, I, I wish we had more time to discuss it and debate it, um, but unfortunately, uh, our, our time has run away with us. Um, so I, I, I would encourage you to get in contact with FIDA and the, and the other panelists and follow this up because one of the things we did want um, was to make sure that people did have a chance to express their views. I noticed that um, there's been some, uh, a lot of really useful points from Sylvie and, and, and some others pointing out what they feel to be priorities going forward. Um, so we'll try and capture some of that and include it in the, in the feedback from this meeting. But I must move now to the final session of our event here today, if you'll excuse me. And um, uh, Louise Baker is the managing director of the global mechanism of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Uh, she joined the UNCCD Secretariat in March 2011 and had been serving as chief of the External Relations Policy and Advocacy Unit prior to this appointment. Her previous assignments include work with the European Parliament and the World Health Organization, and she's lived and worked in Central and Eastern Europe, Africa and Asia, lucky you. <laughs> Ms. Louise, UNCCD played a crucial role during the Food Sim Summit Dialogues with the aim to accelerate action towards the SDGs. And in particular, the UNCCD prepared a series of action guides on priority issues for the UN Food System Summit how to make food production systems more inclusive, sustainable and resilient, uh, such as gender equality, managing drought and water scarcity, nature positive food production. And we heard today a lot of critical recommendations on why humanitarian aid and sustainable development and peace efforts are complementary. Some of the challenges that Pat was raising at the end there, um, to make food production systems more inclusive, sustainable and resilient while also meeting humanitarian immediate needs. It'll be great to hear your insights and closing remarks on how these will be addressed to pave the way for land degradation neutrality in dry land fragile ecosystems. Over to you. And Duncan, I'm doing that in the next two minutes, right? <laughs> Very good. And takeaway messages from today. OK, very good. I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm not sure I can hit all of those, but I'm going to I'm going to do what I can. Um, yeah, obviously, for UNCCD, drylands are, are it. So we focus very much on drylands. And I think that you see the risks um, increasing from population growth, increasing demand, biophysical challenges, uh, shifting cropping patterns, lack of technology, you name it, it's all there. Um, but I think it is kind of, it, there are some opportunities emerging as well. I think for us, I think we're seeing, I'm gonna maybe take the Great Green Wall as maybe an example of something that we're seeing where the world recognizes that drylands are a vital part of the kind of the global system and we need to invest in them to make them work for us. Actually, there will be more drylands as climate change happens. The <laughs> level of um, water scarcity will increase in other regions. And so, you know, getting the kind of dryland food production system right, operational optimal is going to be critical for everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm actually not even sure I'm close to getting all the answers. So my takeaways, I think, from the discussion today are that in dryland areas, the risks are mounting. We at the UNCCD have, a dis, uh, have quite a lot of work on migration and security related work because we see that as vulnerable people get pushed off the land because it's less productive, they, they are forced to look for alternative places to live. They do come into competition between say pastoralists and farmers. So th there is this push factor, but the restoration agenda and getting the restoration agenda right can embed um, a lot more stability, I think, into the system. Um, so geospatially specific work. So understanding the specific site specific nature of stuff is really important. Land use planning. Understanding the trade-offs, because there are trade-offs within a landscape. So understanding how the farmers and the pastoralists work together, building the sustainability agenda there, understanding if you put a runway for a new airport on your most productive land, you can't grow crops on it. So get, getting those, those trade-offs managed 
within the landscape for us. That's the framework of land degradation neutrality. So that's conservation, sustainable management and restoration in harmony. The engagement of stakeholders, critical. Vulnerable people, yes. Smallholders, absolutely. Youth are also a really critical stakeholder that can't be forgotten. A lot of them, and I don't blame them either. I come from a farming community. I wouldn't want to do it. Want, don't want to work on the land anymore. So kind of ensuring that working on the land and the maintenance of these important terrestrial ecosystems has a perspective because nobody wants to eke out a living uh, subsistence farming on the land. They've got to be given a future where they can build a future for their families, for their communities, and they've got to see that in their future. So, so plotting more than just survival. Um, and you're right, the humanitarian and, and long-term planning don't offer, and humanitarian nexus stuff doesn't often work well, but it can do. And I've seen some really, I've heard about some really interesting work in Northern Cameroon, the far north of Cameroon, I think it's called Minoa, um, is a camp for 70,000 people who uh, moved into Cameroon, um, moving away from Boko Haram. And they're really re-greening the area around this camp as we're part of, part of work as a refugee. And actually, and the same, I think you can say in places like Uganda. So they're, they're, it's, it's not impossible to make this mix and to plan um, reliable food systems and humanitarian interventions that contribute to food security as well. For us, then it would move in the direction of decision support so that targets and our efforts actually really support capacity building for policymakers. In dryland areas, bankable projects. And I, 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 don't, I don't know what <laughs> William and Fritjof would say about this, but um, you know, actually sort of developing projects that um, work in the context of, of something like the GEF, but also are investable. And I think for the private sector, the real key is making the, the dryland areas viable for, for private investment and for private inflows. That means creating markets for products that are grown in the, in the dryland areas. As we know, they're providing a vast amount of the food for the world, but are we, are we growing the right products in dryland areas where they can contribute to, to the market? In that sense, I would say infrastructure as well. So a lot of the stuff that's happening is dryland areas are poorly, um, poorly, poorly serviced by um, energy infrastructure. So actually, you grow products, they rot on the side of the street. So getting the energy, uh, energy into communities so they can store their products and then get it to market, also important for private sector. I entirely agree with the enabling environment discussion. So there's governance and conflict is a governance challenge, but at the same time, there are governance challenges in terms of tenure security, access rights that mean that investment into food production, into the restoration of ecosystems doesn't flow as we would want it to do. And I think that touches on, um, touches on women and gender engagement as well. I think I've definitely talked for longer than I was supposed to as ever, but it was a fascinating conversation. These two issues really do come together, uh, immensely complex. I would argue that both of them rely on each other. So uh, security, absolutely vital for the development of a healthy ecosystem and a healthy kind of agricultural system and vice versa, two sides of the same coin. Thank you so much. We must be working together much more closely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise, and, and you did a brilliant job under pressure of, of drawing together so many interesting strands, and thank you for taking the time to do so. I, I think it's fine um, that we're a little bit over time. We've all the attendance participants have stayed um, glued to, to your, your wrapping up, which is really good news. So it just um, it remains to me to thank all of the panelists and speakers for their time and expertise. And uh, thank you too to the uh, participants who stuck with us uh, over, over the last hour and a half. And I hope we've um, all learned and, and enjoyed hearing the, the expert insights that have been presented here. And we've got a bit of a trajectory for this HDP Nexus approach going forward. So thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you, Luis. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. By the way, the paper is online now, huh?